But I've been thinking more about that, and especially in relation to next gen, as you mentioned, Nick. And this mm. is something that I really kick myself for not acting on because, you know, I love uranium, but whenever uh, I was just getting started learning about uranium in the market and, you know, the companies, and I started going on CEO.ca and, and learning about all of these uh, other uranium companies that I didn't know about. Uh, then it was like next gen, but when I heard of next gen, everybody knew about next gen, right? And so I was like, nah, it's you know, it's <laughs> too high. The price is too high. You know, it doesn't. It just didn't fit that cyclicality thesis of you know, buy it when it's low, and then when the when the resource itself goes up in value, then you have a real chance to make money. Uh, but I, I really do regret it because next gen was really hot and then it pulled back enough, uh, to be really decent value. It really did. I think it hit 150 and I just didn't buy it. I was like, nah, it's next gen. Everybody has it. Everybody owns, everybody knows about it. You know, I'm not going to get a good deal for next gen. And, you know, I should have bought it cause I would have easily doubled my money by now. And, uh, it's something that I, I'm I'm still trying to work out because when does a tier one uh, discovery or project become too much? I mean, when when <laughs> is the top is what I'm trying to guess. Because if I follow the commodity, I find that more easy to gauge, so to speak. You know, you look at the price, is, is it going up? Is it going yeah. down? But for the one company, you know, I... I just don't know when I would be planning to exit that. So, you know, people are, I think, as Erwin was saying himself, people are putting next gen in the same basket as chemical, which is strange because, you know, yeah, it, yeah. it's just <laughs> uranium in the ground uh, in a bog of some sort and then a real producing company, which is, you know, the, the biggest producing company. And it's like, when do you know... It, I mean, it's what a billion market uh, cap right now, and Cameco is you know a few billion. You know, was a lot more yeah. a few years ago. When when does next gen get too expensive compared to say energy fuels? And so, at the end of the day, I'm trying to put in X amount of money and get out of it. You know, a lot more you know, five times, 10 times that amount. And for me, it's difficult to tell how the cycle would play out so that I, I would know when to get out and not just hold on for dear life and, and uh, I don't know, lose money. That could happen, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I'll just say something quick and then Jay can uh, chime in. I, I, I think um, a lot of people that get into these types of plays, they're looking for the acquisition. So like you, even if there's a lot of, you know, roller coaster activity because next gens have that as well. Like you can be, you're, you know, you're hoping to be more comfortable and waiting for that big acquisition where it's easier for you to not worry about getting out. And 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 you're right. Ivanhoe's had some of that roller coaster as well. Um, I uh, I did want to make a really what I think is a really important point, And War Warren Irwin has touched on this. You know, so like I, I haven't really talked about him before, so this will kind of be like the like this is why you should follow. War, like, uh, you know, what he's done and, and use it as a model. He made so many great points about how he tried to sell this to, uh, like in, in his recent talk, how he tried to sell next gen, you know, to the other big investors. I was not aware of this where at a retail level, um, there was a really growing interest in next gen and it still couldn't get over the hump with the institutional, with the big money. And that's kind of where it was at, where it was getting to a dollar. And, you know, like when they started, ha you know, they had a, res a, a maiden resource and they had the other stuff. That's where it kind of turned. So I think it's really valuable to try to look at, you know, these potential tier one companies or if they're already tier one and try to figure out, even if people are talking about it, which types of people are talking about it? Is it mm -hmm. the big money versus mm -hmm. small money? And, and I'll even bring that up on Ivanhoe. Now, I... I personally, yeah, I mean, I, I kick myself even more for Ivanhoe because I, I haven't even, you know, bought next gen moving up, but I, but I, but I haven't bought any Ivanhoe whatsoever. I'm still, more, uh, you know, much more skeptical on the Congo, on the DRC than Saskatchewan. So already you have that huge mm -hmm. difference 
between two tier ones. But even at this level, and Jay and I were chatting about this, um, you know, Ivanhoe, I, I really feel there was more of a game changer last year with the Kakula drilling results. And so I should, I should probably think more about the, you know, what I've just been describing. Like, have people really figured out that um, you know, what they've done with Kakula is so big? Because the way I see it, before this was more talking about you know, Ivanhoe has a copper play. They've got a zinc play, um, you know, both in the DRC, and then they've got uh, the platinum play in South Africa. Is this Kamoa Kakula thing so big that it's all of a sudden like the the, the value attached to Ivanhoe is is like before it was kind of uh, roughly equal between the three, and now like over eighty percent of the value is like Kamoa and Kakula because it's so big. And I think a lot of people haven't really looked into that, you know, how that changed in the last year and also have the institutions picked up on it. So I, I don't have plans to buy Ivanhoe, but like, that's the type of stuff that I think is worth thinking about, uh, because like we're, we're kind of in the middle of that and, uh, and maybe, maybe it does have a lot more to run, uh, you know, just because it's so significant now, um, uh, compared to, you know, just a year or two ago. Nick mentioned something um, about a possible buyout for um, those two one assets and, and how most people will play it. But the thing that breaks my heart is that I don't know if I could hold, like if I could sell. So so let's say um, either ha Ivanhoe or NextGen or, or any sort of, you know, project like that gets taken out by a major my thought is okay so this gets taken out by a major at close to the bottom of the commodity cycle why don't i hold on until the price goes up right and so i think i think for me because i'm so tied up in the whole cycle thesis i think i just hold on to it even after it you know it's sold for a decent price i'd be like no but sure. if they're buying it for this much then surely it's going to be worth more but then again Majors overpay all the time, you know, and yeah. so maybe that would be a trap. Maybe that wouldn't work out. I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really, um, I, I really like the subject and there's a lot you can tie into it. And Nick mentioned earlier, you have to look at where the discovery cycle is. So for example, like gold right now, because of the five year bear market, there hasn't been much exploration. So you could say there's kind of a dearth for quality gold projects across the board. Um, anyway, so if you're gonna, you know, try to pinpoint it and um, you know hone it even like closer to just the tier one assets, you have even less of them available. So one of the appeals with the tier one is it, it is a lot to do with the market cycle and where we are. But if we get a definitive bull market cycle going and there are so few of these tier one assets even available for sale, then I think that the uh, market premium that a take out you know offer could, could encompass would just be on um, maybe orders of magnitude just greater than what we can even fathom, right? So that's something to keep in mind as well because the major producers, they need really big, massive projects that are very economical to move the scale, right? Like yeah. we've, seen so many, we've seen so many of these gold producers, they won't invest no matter how good your uh, NPV or IRR are um, if you're only a 100,000 ounce per year producer, right? Like even... If those economics look fantastic, a, a big major, uh, for example, like a, a Rangold or a Barrick or something, they're not going to go in there and bother kind of wasting their time, um, so to speak, to, to invest in this asset because it's just not going to move the needle enough, right? So if you have a tier one, they might be more inclined to just overpay for it because it's it's really going to make you know a dent in their production profile. Yeah. So that that's mm -hmm. something to keep in mind, and I, I didn't want to add also um, the, the point where we're talking about tier ones and if they're getting expensive because when the market catches on, these stocks start catching a bid, and um, you know it's kind of a rough ballpark kind of figure. But let's say when a stock crosses the one dollar marker, then a lot of funds or institutions start getting, you know, th the stock starts entering the radar. It's no longer really considered kind of a junior micro cap. So then maybe that's what moves the needle and th the share price kind of goes exponential at, at that point as well. So then, you know, it's just momentum feeding on itself. So then you want to be cautious as an investor.